Okay. All right. So we are very excited to welcome Steve Kraus tonight. Steve is the head of Farrier Services and a senior lecturer at Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. Prior to that, he had over 40 years experience in his own farrier business, showing many breeds of horses participating in diverse disciplines. Steve has shod horses used for dressage, jumping, endurance, <laughs> racing, polo, three-day eventing, driving, <clears throat> flat harness racing, and draft horses. He is known for troubleshooting lame, injured, and underperforming horses. In 2016, he was inducted into the International <clears throat> Farriers Hall of Fame, and in 2018, he was the first farrier inducted into the Cornell Veterinary Honor Society, known as Phi Zeta Alpha. Steve is also the author of the new book, Shoeing the Modern Horse, The Horse Owner's Guide to Farriery and Hoof Care. So welcome, Steve. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, everything, everybody hearing me okay and seeing the screen and we don't have to make any adjustments. Yep. Looks great. Uh, okay. So we're going to talk about a lot of things. This is an introductory lecture that I uh, give to uh, veterinary students that uh, don't know that much about horses to get them started. We use this also for the animal science students in, in the uh, horse um, biology course. And we're gonna talk about a lot of things and hopefully it provokes a lot of thinking and help you understand a lot of things um, during you know this. And we're kind of free form here. And so if there's anything uh, that needs to be cleared up, you can signal um, Mary and um, you know, she'll interrupt me with no problems. And, and just wanna point out that we're gonna you know, just show a lot of different things. And uh, this, this photo right here, let me get my cursor right here. If everybody can see the cursor, um, it's very important where these lines are. They indicate a lot of things. We're gonna talk a lot about that. And it's a, it's a great way I've, I've taught about hoof balance. So let's begin. Um, all right, somehow my screen is just froze up. Oh, there we go. Whoop. No, no, we're not supposed to be doing that. All right, there we go. So look, the horse's foot, um, it looks pretty simple on the outside. Um, it's got, you know, a, a symmetry to it. And this is a pretty nice foot right here. Um, the other one here has, has a shoe on it. And we look at these feet and we take a lot for granted, but there's a lot going on inside here. And not all feet are the same. That's the first thing we need to talk about. Uh, they have different shapes um, and there's reasons for that, which we'll talk about. Um, and so even the differentiation between fronts and hinds. Um, so the fronts are nice and round uh, and they're for supporting uh, you know, the, the horse has most of his weight on the front end. And so that rounder, wider foot is, is, you know, been developed to support the horse's weight, but it should not be um, a heavy weight bearing structure. Uh, it's more for guidance. Think of the horse as like um, uh, pushing a wheelbarrow. And so the hind end has that pointier, almost looks like a spade shovel shape. And that's for the horse to dig his toes into the ground and use his toes to propel the front feet forward. And so certainly for dressage horses, we want the horse to have natural self-carriage and be light on the front end and, and use the hind end well. But all for other types of work, it, that is the basis of horses staying sound and performing well is horses that use their hind ends well. And when that doesn't happen, um, that's when we have lameness and underperformance problems. So to give you an appreciation, um, you know, feet do differ um, from breed to breed. And so the types of horses that we use for specific sports, some of the basics are the same across the board, but the feet that the horses have um, and what we're asking of the horse is different. And that's something that barriers uh, need to learn to understand. And so I always talk to my students about if you're going to shoe for a particular type of horse, you need to study the use of that horse. It's all not the same. We cannot shoe performance horses in a generic way uh, and take care of their feet in a generic way and expect to have 
them do well. And so if we look at you know, the, the, the cross section, sagittal section, um, you can see there's a lot here in this foot. And this is a very nice normal looking foot. You have a nice thick hoof wall. And you can see how these different layers are, are attached to, to the coffin bone um, right, right across here. We have good sole thickness. Um, we have a digital cushion. Um, and then we can see some of these bones. Inside the horse's foot, there's two and a half bones basically, because here's the hairline right across here. And that's an important marker to us. And the navicular bone and the coffin bone is here. And we only have half of the, of the pastern bone. And so we look at these inner hoof structures. And now I'm, I have some lines here talking about what they're doing. Um, so uh, we, we refer to this as here's uh, first phalanx, second phalanx, and third phalanx is the coffin bone. And I put this little star here. That's really important. We call this Duckett's dot. Um, and a, a really smart farrier by the name of du uh, Davy Duckett uh, taught us this. And if you look and see where this dot occurs, it is right, this is the tip of the main extensor tendon. And right here is the tip of the deep flexor tendon. And these are the two main tendons responsible for propulsion and for flexing the foot forward and extending it. And this dot lines up almost right below it. And it's just uh, behind the, the tip of the frog of the trim frog. And so that's a landmark uh, that we'll talk about later on and that helps guiding us for trimming. Um, and in this mark here is usually at the widest part of the foot. And we call this the center of rotation. I'm sorry, center of articulation. Um, with my, get my cursor right there. That's the center of articulation. And this dot right here is what we call the center of, of rotation. And so when that horse loads his foot, this bone is gonna flex down that way as this coffin bone flexes upward. So as the horse loads, these two surfaces you see are covered by cartilage, which are is more slippery than ice on ice. Um, so that's a very important for this cartilage to stay healthy. And right here, is our navicular bone. And again, you have beautiful articular surfaces right here, all this very, very slippery cart cartilage that has to stay lubricated. And when that starts to erode and fail, that's when we have lame horses. And then right, this digital cushion is like, that's what it is, it is a cushion. And this works kind of like um, a sponge. And what I mean is people confuse this all the time and I've heard, uh, the old sayings, a horse has uh, five hearts in his body, you know, one in his chest and one in each foot that pumps blood up. Actually, it works the opposite in the foot. Um, this digital cushion, actually, when it compresses, yes, it, it, it forces blood up the foot. But when the horse unloads it, it's like a sponge and absorbs um, a, and fills with blood when, it, when the foot is striking the ground properly. And um, so it's actually reverse of the heart. Heart has muscle around it that contracts where this works with the weight of the horse. And if we look inside the hoof capsule itself, we can see a different view here. And um, these, these are the lateral cartilages which help stabilize the foot and protect some of the ligaments that attach there. There's that navicular bone that we worry about so much. Here's the flexor surface of, of the coffin bone. And um, so you can see there's a lot going on inside the foot. And what I'm trying to do with this little bit of anatomy lesson here is just give you an appreciation for how complicated these feet really are and how important it is to figure out how to um, get them working right. And this graphic, sorry, my computer is very sensitive. Um, this graphic again shows you more complicated stuff going on uh, where all these tendons and ligaments and how they attach. And you can see some blood supply and there's your circulatory system. And so when, when you put all this together in this little box of a hoof wall where we're cutting and driving nails and trying to get right, you can have an appreciation that this is not as simple as it looks to make all this stuff work right. And so we'll talk more about that. These um, are, are micro photos of the lamini. The lamini are 
what a attaches the coffin bone to the hoof wall. And so you have fingers within fingers within fingers. And so even though the hoof looks pretty small in relation to the horse, the surface area of attachment is tremendous with all these you know, different surfaces that, that um, uh, attach the skeleton of the horse to, to the foot and takes all this abuse of landing and, and jumping and running and, and so on. And even right down to what the micro photograph here of what they call the basement membrane. And this is where all the nutrition uh, and, and nutrients, you know, finally find their ways in to, uh, from, you know, the, the circulatory system and build the hoof wall. So again, very, very complicated and there's a lot going on inside that foot. And so I, I like this picture. This is the St. Louis Arch and you're probably going, what the heck does that have to do with a horse's foot? Um, but here, now this uh, section here, obviously is a cadaver foot on the left. Um, but that's a cantonary arch. It's one of the strongest structures in nature or architecture. And you can see these old stone, stone walls support a tremendous amount of weight. And, and, and so does this, this foot. So by design, nature is a pretty good designer. And when we mess with it too much, that's when things are, um, don't go the way we'd like to. And so what are hoof influences? Obviously, this foot needs a little attention. But how does a foot get like this? And so what, what are the things that either cause problems or, or create uh, you know, things that we have to work with? So certainly moisture conditions are a big factor. And being that moisture conditions change from places around the country, from season to season, and year to year, we're dealing with you know, something that is, is never really the same and it's hard for us to control. Um, nutrition plays a big role and the horse is, it's not just what you feed the horse, but the horse's ability to absorb the nutrients. And some horses have a hard time absorbing what we think is the right thing to put in their diets. And so some of the better um, hoof growth supplements have been figured out to become more bioavailable, especially for horses with, with problem feet. So nutrition does play a role, but it has to be the right nutrition. Certainly the ground surface that the horse is working on, and again, we use horses in all types of places for doing all kinds of things. And then horses on very abrasive ground like out west um, will have to have really, really tough feet, especially if they're not wearing shoes. And even with shoes, they, they're, you know, the ground is so abrasive, there's no such thing as reusing or resetting a shoe in certain parts of the country. They'll wear them out pretty quickly. Um, but you know, some horses are used on pavement, other horses are used on nice favorable rings and, and the cushioning of the rings uh, are very you know, nice to the horse's joints and feet. So different ground surfaces are, have a huge um, influence. And definitely the confirmation, and we'll talk a bit about this as we go further on. The confirmation dictates a lot of the shape of the horse's foot and how it distorts or does not distort. And in my experience, horses with really good balanced conformation usually have really nice symmetrical feet and vice versa when they're not. And shoeing or lack of trimming or shoeing uh, definitely has an influence. Anything we do as farriers and hoof trimmers um, will have an influence either positive or negative. So we try and make that as you know, positive as possible and appropriate for the horse. And if the horses are not getting trimming and hoof care, well, that's gonna have an influence also. The general health of the horse um, has a certain influence on the feet. We can see um, that the horse has had a fever or other type of uh, shock to the system by the growth rings or unusual growth rings that show up. So the, it takes about a, a year to grow a new hoof out from the hairline down. And some of the disruptions you may see will exactly follow any health problems the horse had, has had in the past. And certainly diseases, hoof diseases, which we'll talk about, um, has a tremendous effect on feet and doing permanent damage and distorting feet and, and changing the architecture of the foot. And different breeds have different types of feet. 
you know, thoroughbreds do not have the same feet as Morgan horses and so on. Um, so the breed characteristics um, and the farriers who specialize in, in specific breeds um, will use specific shoes and specific techniques to deal with these different breed characteristics and uses of these breeds. And so again, the breed definitely will drive what we deal with with feet. So thoroughbreds, for instance, um, are thin skinned and light boned and a lot of thoroughbreds have very thin hoof walls and thin soles and are, can be difficult to you know, keep good feet on them. And so here's just an example of, of shoeing and trimming influence. Believe it or not, both these feet, and if you look at my date stamp, um, are the same foot on the same day. The foot on the left was an Amish road horse that they uh, wasn't happy about the way the horse was shod. The horse was uh, not going well and lame. And you can see uh, how uh, this horse had a very, uh, sorry, my computer does things on me. Um, I'm looking for my cursor here. You can see we have all this excessive heel growth um, uh, we have some thrush going on here, some rotten frog. And here is after shoeing this horse, uh, after trimming the foot to proper proportions um, and upsizing the shoe two sizes, uh, this horse is very, very happy to trot down the road without any lameness problems. So um, definitely shoeing and trimming proper or improper has a huge influence. Um, disease influences, chronic laminitis, you can see from, you remember that nice perfect foot I showed you earlier. Um, now we've lost a, a lot of that. We have stretched lamini, stretched lamini, and you know the, the whole architecture of the foot has been disrupted. And so just a brief little talk about you know, what is normal and what's not. And, and the definition of laminitis really typically is inflammation of the lamini. That's the attachment of, of the, you know, the, the, the coffin bone to the hoof wall. And then, but that inflammation can cause the lamini to fail. And so because we have uh, a, uh, an attachment of this deep flexor tendon that is under tension, that's gonna pull that coffin bone away when that lamini fails. So that's um, a, a foot on the bottom there with rotation versus normal. And the, the, the amount of lamini that fail um, will influence how much rotation there is. And so here's a cross section of a cadaver foot with a, a chronically foundered horse. And if you look right here, this, is, the, this hoof wall has, ro has, has kind of pushed up that way, but the coffin bone is pulled downward. And now all this is all that disrupted lamini and that scar tissue, and we typically remove most of that along with the right shoeing principles. So a confirmation effects, and I'm gonna give you the quick version of understanding a little bit more about confirmation and how it affects not only the, the, the feet, but how the horse moves and, and what we talk about balance. And this is, you wanna read more about this. It's in my book, of course, and but the, these charts um, are in Dr. Doug Butler's book of shoeing in your right mind, also in his textbook, The Principles of Farriery. And uh, Dr. Butler is a longtime good friend and great influence on, on my career. But we have to have three dimensional thinking um, to think about you know confirmation and and how legs are uh, on a horse's body. And so uh, I found the best way to describe it is using an, an X, Y, and Z axis. And this, this will influence what the leg confirmation is, what the distortion and wear that you're gonna have on a horse's foot. So briefly, if we talk about the X and Y axis, the X axis is looking at the horse standing right in front or right behind, whichever end we're talking about. And this is when we talk about a horse that's either base wide or base narrow, are the hooves outside the chest or inside the chest? Think of a plumb line coming down. And or are the hooves outside the, the, the uh, hips or inside? So that's your X axis. The Y axis would be is if we have a horse standing on a glass table and we're looking straight up the leg. 
and or if we're hanging over the horse looking straight down and that's your rotational limb deviations this is your toe in and toe out and so um, X and Y can blend in various ways, but we try to address the most overriding. So a horse typically can be base wide and towed out, very hard to be base wide and nice and straight. And a, so there's a blend of X and Y, and typically horses are that are base narrow and towed in, that's somewhat in the range of normal for a lot of horses. So a slight deviation one way or the other away from perfect is, is somewhat acceptable and workable. And um, it's very, very hard for a horse to be base wide and towed in at the same time. Uh, you can imagine what that looks like. And we do see some horses that are base narrow and towed out. And those horses move like a, an egg beater. They just step all over themselves. Um, so X and Y tends to blend, but not always. And then the side view will be looking at, you know, standing alongside, look either right square at the horse's hip or right square from the horse's shoulder. And that's your hoof angle, your position and posture under the leg. And those are your breakover support type um, problems that horses can have. And um, so this is, um, you know, if whatever uh, axis is off, that affects the kinds of problems that you ex can expect to have as a farrier working on the horse or as a veterinarian. So here's just a quick example. Base wide conformation distorts with a lateral flare, this asymmetric shape, the horse lands on the outside toe and then loads on the inside heel all the time. Hard to make that horse land flat. And so hook distortion and, and wear can either be caused by inaccurate trimming, poor conformation or lameness, and it's our job to figure out which. And so hooves on crooked legged horses do not wear themselves to correct balance. And that is one of these myths that are out there. Um, no, they actually wear themselves if they're barefoot, the opposite way they need to be worn. So it's pretty simple if a horse has um, deviations to look at that horse and judge where it needs to be trimmed and, and helped with shoes. And But lame horses are gonna wear to comfort. And so we have to decide, is this a lame horse? Is this a crooked horse? Or is this a horse that just is, has not been attended to properly? And so here's a you know, very distorted foot. It's not symmetrical like some of the other ones I'll show you. Um, and so here's a, a y-axis deviation. So if you look at the photo on the left, you see that the cannon bone is misaligned with the radius and it produces a flare on the inside of the foot. And there you see it on that same foot right there. And you can see how this lateral side just breaks off and crushes. So if I'm gonna shoe this horse, I'm gonna trim them to the best of my ability. And then I'm going to um, put fit that shoe a little bit wider and give them some metal on this shoe where the foot isn't and needs to be to help balance that leg. And so, as we'll get further on, um, keeping this horse barefoot is not helpful, um, even though he has a pretty good foot, but it's not gonna stay good because he's gonna keep destroying that uh, lateral heel. Um, and here's a, a radiograph of what looks like um, a base wide horse, and this is an x-axis um, imbalance. And, and the thing that you can really look at is see these two dots here where my cursor is? Those are called foramen, and that's uh, a holes in the uh, coffin bone where the blood vessels come through, and they should be parallel to the ground. So the radiographs, what we call balanced radiographs, are helpful, but we usually can see this in you know, how the hoof is distorting and to try and get this horse to land flat. And some of them, it's impossible to get them to land flat without some kind of shoeing appliance. But you could also look further up the leg, and you can see how uh, the, the pastern bone is not very well uh, proportioned and it's crunching. Uh, and, you know, so the horse takes a, a beating on, on the medial side of the foot where that arrow is. And so um, horseshoeing, you know, uh, uh, we have to think about gravity, uh, momentum and inertia um, versus muscle, bones, ligaments, and tendons. So you know, horses cannot escape the laws of physics. And so I'd maintain that purebred breeding 
should be used to strengthen um, horses to have uh, better quality confirmation and, and durability. But sometimes it's it weakens horses because they breed the wrong horses for the wrong reasons. They get involved with fads. And so even though purebred breeding should strengthen, it can also weaken horses if we don't breed horses the right way. And again, force equals mass times acceleration, especially in, in any sports where our horses are being used with a high degree of intensity. And dressage is an intense sport. So proper confirmation can handle abnormal forces, which the horse is subjected to. Um, and certainly proper nutrition and conditioning are just as important. But the taller and heavier a horse is, the more correct it needs to be. Just think about it. Um, if you have a little shed that's not very tall and it's not really that plumb and it snows a bit on the shed, it's not going to do much. But if you build a big barn that's not plumb and you get a big snow load on the roof, it's going to start to um, slip sideways. So again, taller, heavier, and horses need to be more correct. And certainly horses that are used in harder work and advanced competition will um, definitely need to have the right confirmation to, to succeed and stay sound. And so, but don't overlook heart. Some horses with lousy confirmation um, uh, really give themselves all to us. And so here's a good example of force times mass uh, equals force, force equals mass times acceleration. This is a Cornell polo player galloping around in the arena. And you can see the forces that are put on this leg as the horse is tilting sideways, has all this weight on his back. And this horse can just keep doing this because everything is lined up pretty well. If we're ever going to do any uh, trimming and shoeing, what I like to talk to the students about is here are your basic tools. Um, and so if you look on the top, you see a, 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 a hoof trimming and the hoof nippers that are used are have a finer blade. And if you look at the handles, they have that little tapered end. And then if you have to pull shoes, the, 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 the shoe pull-offs are a much thicker, heavier edge, and they have like a dull kind of a, a ball on the end of them. So it's just important to know that if you ever have to attempt to do any of this stuff, because you could ruin your hoof nippers um, if you try pulling shoes with them. Um, and the first, so if we have to ever pull a shoe, we have to get rid of these little clinches, and those are the bent over ends of the nails um, that need to come off uh, so we don't rip the hoof wall up. And so one way to do that is to take the rasp and gently brush over the top of the nails with um, the smoother side of the rasp. And then we like to start at the heels with our shoe pulling tool and just a quick little jerk. And you can then we can smash the the, the shoe down, and then we can pull individual nails out instead of trying to pull the whole hoof off. And they, um, they also make a tool that fits right into the creases of the shoe called the crease nail puller. And you can see how I'm leveraging these nails out and always jerk towards the toe, stabilize the foot, and the horse won't object to all this. And so let's talk about trimming the average foot. And um, it, it's, you have to be like a bit of an artist or a sculptor to do this. So when a sculptor approaches a, a block of, of wood uh, or stone, um, he has the end result in his mind and removes everything that doesn't belong there. So that's how we have to trim feet. We don't trim feet like our trimming our fingernails and we kind of nip off. Well, it looks like let's just nip off this little extra stuff. No, uh, to, to properly trim feet, we have to have the what we want to end up with. And then we just remove everything that doesn't look like the foot. That red star in the middle is that ducket's dot that we talked about. And again, that's right under the, the, the extensor tendon and the um, deep flexor tendon. And so here's the end result. And let's see how we got there. So if we start the, our trim at the beginning, and this is a grown out foot, it really, the heels are run forward, they're way too long, um, and we can clean out the frog a little bit and find Duckett's dot, you know, approximately where it is, and that's a landmark. And you can see there's a lot of hoof in front of that dot, and not so much behind it to my yellow line, and there's a huge space 
um, back here where, where the horse is lacking the support. So the foot is not under the leg well at all uh, on this horse that's really grown out. And then, so I'm gonna finish removing, exfoliating the sole and frog and cleaning that up. And then I'm, here's, a, I did a half trim where it shows you where I removed the excess heel and uh, trying to you know, use the ducket dot as a landmark um, to give me a reference point. And, and now I've moved my support further back. Now, even though this horse had a lot of heel, he didn't have a very high angle. And that's another problem that a lot of people have with. And I've been told many, many times in my career um, uh, when I'm starting to trim a horse's foot, don't touch the heels, you're gonna give him a bow tendon. Well, I've been doing this nearly 60 years and I've never given a horse a bow tendon by trimming um, the proper amount of heel off. So I'm just wondering when that's going to happen. Um, but so that's the half trim, and you can see the, how the proportions are changing on this foot. And now we've finished the nippers coming around, and now we just have to do a little rasping to clean things up. And now after I've smoothed things up, uh, we have the full trim, and now with using Duckett Stout as a reference point, we have a proportion uh, of one third of that distance in front and two thirds behind. And I refer to this as, uh, this is the golden ratio type trim for your Z axis, anterior, posterior um, uh, balance of the foot. And this is a great way that I teach all my students this. And um, it's a great way they can check their work and, and get the proper alignment. And constantly we have people telling us how much better their horses are moving um, we have things like better dressage scores when horses weren't in this proportion. We have people telling me they have faster barrel racing times. We have reported race horses from some of my former students winning races before they never have ridden uh, uh, one before. So this is uh, provable over and over again that this is one of the most important things in, in trimming a foot. And so just a little bit about proper rasping that we don't over rasp, that we get the right proportions and then we stop. And so we have a nice uniform hook wall here that's ready to shoe. And you can see the difference between the fore and after of how things have moved around and putting, putting the foot in the proper place under the limb. And now here's your basic shoe put on. And so here's your Z axis uh, correct stance. And again, there's your ducket dot where that is. So the red lines, I cannot change. Those are the landmarks. Uh, the, the mark at the heel here um, is just a, a, another guide that we could draw on the floor. Um, and again, that just tells me where the perpendicular is to the heel. I can change this and I can change that. And so that's what I'm doing with shoeing. And then with trimming, I should say, and then with shoeing, if I need to artificially shorten this line, if I can't get it with a trim, well, that's where our shoe modifications come in like a roll toe and we can put a little bit more heel back there if we need to. So this also helps. So again, getting back to this golden ratio trim, just go right through it. Um, 1.61 to one is the exact golden ratio and um, the calipers, which I'll show you in a minute, in a minute have that exact ratio to it. So here's again where the ducket dot uh, is. Here's where the finished toe is. Here is where the shoe would be fitting with a little basic heel support. And that dotted line is where I see a lot of feet trimmed and, and, and that's when shoes are too short, especially on front feet to really support the, the leg properly. And if we do this correctly, we have this nice, normal alignment here on the right. Um, we have everything lined up. We have a, a proper coffin bone angle. Um, and then when we don't do that right and have excessive toe and too little heel, and we have, you know, obviously we are, our proportion is off now. We have too much in front of, uh, of Duckett's dot. We have that broken back hoof axis um, and a negative angle on the coffin bone. And then all the way up here, not enough heel is taken off this foot. And sometimes horses have this flexural deformity. And um, 
this is broken forward and you can see how there's poor alignment, uh, especially of the, of the joint between the coffin bone and the pastern bone. Yeah, and this is out of a, a book um, and when showing like a high heel may not necessarily keep the foot under the leg. It all has to be lined up properly. So we need to have the be cognizant of where these plumb lines fall so that the horse has, can load his, his feet properly. And that means a heel first, slight heel first landing, and then rolling forward as he bears weight. Um, and as one of my clients would say, my horse rolls like a wheel after you shoe him. Um, and if you see a horse landing toe first, we know something's not right. And so here again, talking about this Z-axis alignment using the golden ratio, this horse has a, a rolled toe on the front um, to achieve that. And here are the calipers, um, the reverse of that caliper on the other side equals the shorter distance, and that's the exact same toe length also. So that's your geometric balance to the golden ratio. And so why do we shoe horses anyway? Oh, Steve? Yes. Um, I think this is actually a good uh, question has come in, and I think maybe we'll do the drawing. Okay, good. That's okay. a great place to stop. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do the drawing first. So again, thank you to Trafalgar Square Books. Uh, the winner of tonight's drawing will receive a copy of Steve's book. And you do need to be online. So let's see. Do we have Eliza Rome on the call? Okay, I think not. Next, Abigail Picou. Mm. Oh dear, all these absent people. <laughs> okay. Uh, Erica Fergus. Nope. We will get one. Ella I see what they're missing. I know. <laughs> uh, nope. Uh, Lois Pinkos. Nope. All right, let's see. This was supposed to be quick. Ruby Lewis. Mm, yes, we have Ruby Lewis. Okay, fantastic. Um, so Zoe and Ruby, um, I will email you after and congratulations on winning the book and thank you to Trafalgar Square Books. Um, and then Steve, the question that came in is how often is it advisable to x-ray feet? Whenever there's uh, obviously a lameness that we can't you know, figure out why or something's not right, um, veterinarians will go through a series of um, maneuvers first to try and pinpoint whether they need a, a radiograph or not. Um, they usually do flexion tests and uh, watch the horse go, and there's even some more sophisticated stuff that's used now. Um, but if, if there's any like uh, out of the ordinary distortion, uh, obviously any something is not quite right in the horse's gait, you know, aside from being lame, um, uh, or the horse has a history of prior problems, it certainly, you know, several x rays are very helpful. I mean, more information is always better than less. Uh, but generally, you know, without any existing problems and things looking normal, uh, x-rays are probably not really necessary, but certainly help us if there's problems. So it's not like you have to, you would recommend, I mean, no. unless there were a problem, no. it was it wouldn't be like you'd need to x-ray like every six months or something. No, not at all. And then when you um, are looking to buy a horse, would you recommend doing x-rays of the feet? Yeah, I would, uh, if I'm purchasing a horse, I would want a, 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 a soundness exam, which is basically part of the soundness exam is also do the eyes see well, do the lungs sound good? Do, does the heart work sound like it's okay? And definitely there's a little bit of stress put on, you know, with flexion tests you know, can we easily make this horse a little bit sore? That would make us want to look further. Um, 
So yeah, if you're, if you're spending a lot of money on a horse, it would probably be smart to do a basic lameness exam and possibly include radiographs as part of that. And it may not necessarily be his feet. Uh, it could be a knee or a hock or, you know, a pastern joint or whatever. You know, if there's something that flags abnormal, um, you know, response to a flexion test or, or uh, something that doesn't look like it belongs there, some lump on his joint or something, you'd want to know what that is. Okay, great. All right. So I think that's it for questions for now. So I think why don't we go ahead and continue? So why do we shoe horses? Who came up with this first anyway? You know, and we've been doing this for a couple thousand years. I talk about this in the book. There's a whole chapter and not every horse is shod, uh, but most performance horses are. There's some very, very high level horses competing without shoes. And what we always have to understand when we see that is that these are really expensive horses most of the time, very put together very well and uh, on very, very favorable um, uh, uh, footing and, and cared for very well and not turned out in, in difficult conditions. Um, but you know, the main reason most people think about uh, shoeing horses um, is for protection of the feet, to keep them from wearing away or getting damaged. And that's certainly valid. In some parts of the country, it's very, very important. In other parts, it's less important. Uh, but we can manage the hoof capsule with shoes because we, when we do have distortion from uh, poor conformation, or let's not say poor conformation, but less than desirable, we can actually put metal where the foot isn't like we discussed earlier. And that's a way to not only manage the hoof capsule, but deal with um, the conformation. And the other thing we can do with, with shoes is correct and enhance gait faults. Whereas barefoot, where we have less ability to do that, we have to rely on trimming to a point, which is very, very important. But um, without the right trim, uh, you know, the best shoe is not going to help us. Um, and we, as we said, we manage confirmation faults uh, with what we do to shoes. There's a whole list of horseshoe modifications that, so it's not just a shoe put on but it's what is done to the shoe to help the mechanics, help the support factors that we cannot do unless we have a shoe. And definitely some horses work in uh, places where they need extra traction for safety, um, which you know I've heard people say, uh, barefoot is the safest traction. I disagree with that wholeheartedly uh, on ice, on slippery roads, on uh, mud. Um, I would not want to play polo at high speed barefoot. Sorry. Um, I've seen people try to do it and crash and burn. Um, prevent and cure lameness. Certainly the, the shoes give us ability to do things to the feet that we can do with boots and, and wraps and so on, but there's a lot we can do with shoes uh, to, to deal with lameness and injury problems. And I think for most horses, it provides a competitive edge. And um, so a well-shod horse uh, for the purpose that he's being used for is often gonna do much better than the average um, horse without shoes or the right shoes on the horse. Um, and, and shoes are not the same as boots. Boots tend to, uh, they might be great for trail riding and, and, and low maintenance stuff, but the, the, the fact that the shoes are configured in many different ways and we do things to the ground surface to make them penetrate um, the surface they're working on or stay above the surface they're working on, depending on what the, the, the use is. So boots are not quite the same um, as the shoes are. And barefoot management, and I've studied a lot of, about it, has many different models. And you know, some for some people, mean barefoot means no hoof care at all. Sometimes it means very, very, very special hoof care. Um, and there are many, many different models that are used. That they have different names: the four-point trim, the high-performance trim, the Strasser trim, the ABC trim. And I've studied all of these, and they're all just that much different. But the basics are somewhat the same. Some just do certain things more extreme than others. And when myself and other farriers manage 
horse's feet without shoes, we do some of the same similar things, just not as extreme as some of these things are. So I've been told that farriers don't know how to trim feet, only barefoot trimmers know how to trim feet. And I, I, I highly disagree with that. Um, then there's what we call natural hoof care. And I just don't know what that really means. Um, and that has a whole bunch of different definitions. And then I've run into the extreme anti-horseshoe people who basically tell lies about how horseshoes create necrotic burdens on the horse's liver. And it just goes on and on. And it just makes me crazy. Um, and they certainly deny that the hoof damage being done is shoeless. Uh, and damage is only done by shoes. Well, yeah, uh, there are shoes that are put on that are done by incompetent people. Um, and so everybody can do damage to horses' feet if they're not doing it in the right way appropriately and so on. Um, again, you know, they, the, the reason why some of the barefoot things don't hold water is they will say, well, we have to use boots to go trail riding, but we keep the horse barefoot. Well, there's nothing wrong with that for sure. Uh, but that doesn't mean horseshoes are bad too. Um, the truth about horseshoes is the proper trim is the most important part of what we do. And if the shoe does not fit properly or it's not the right shoe, the horse is better off without it. And horses that need shoes will underperform or suffer without proper shoes. And athletic horses need athletic shoes. We're asking these horses to do things beyond walking around a pasture and we need to help them. Um, so I uh, came up with this idea a long time ago. I call it the WITH protocol and there's a chapter in the book about this. And so I just asked a simple question, what kind of work is the horse used for? And there are certain types of work. Shoes are definitely, um, uh, you have to have them to do that kind of work. And there's other kind, maybe you don't need them. Intensity refers to collection, speed, and power is how much of this horse's uh, in, uh, strength is being transmitted to the ground. Uh, a, a horse pulling logs out of the woods may be going slow, but he's very intense. He needs to transmit that power to the ground efficiently, otherwise he'll slip while he's trying to pull this. And so those horses are shod with heavy shoes with big heel cocks to give them to transmit the power to the ground. And so horses at speed and so on, you know, transmit their power in, in, in an obviously different way. And duration, um, the D stands for is distance. Is this horse uh, on a, a very intense training schedule? Is this horse being, being used for distance riding? Or, you know, the horse may wear his feet out if you have to, uh, ride this horse over, you know, long distances. And that refers to terrain. Some horses are in groom rings and can do very well without any protection. And some horses in some places out West, um, the hard ground will wear their feet away faster than they can grow it. And then the individual horse, as we talked about, what's the breed of the horse, the confirmation, how does the owner take care of this horse? So all these things you know, interact to form the right plan for your horse, whether it can be shoeless or not, whether the right kind of shoes and so on. So these are things I think about when people ask me the, these questions. Um, sometimes barefoot doesn't work. This was a thoroughbred off the track. They pulled his shoes and turned him out in the pasture and he was in shape and ran around and just wore a hole through the bottom of his foot. Um, and sometimes shoes don't work. So here are shoes that are too small, um, you know, not fitting the horse or left on too long. Again, this is damaging the foot in other ways. So there's no one way here. And um, there's, there's bad things can happen as well as good, the good things. So it's important to understand knowing normal so you can recognize abnormal, what's not right for your horse. Um, here's a very nice, normal, healthy foot again trim to the right proportions, a healthy frog, a nice hoof wall. This is an easy horse to shoe. Um, so and this is just happens to be a polo horse at Cornell. And so we use a lot of these horses for my students to learn very basic shoeing. These horses mostly stand really well and they have good symmetrical feet. Otherwise they wouldn't be playing polo. And so they're great horses to learn on. Um, if you can, but this is not the way to do it. <laughs> So I see these feet with shoes that are too small, not trimmed right, and um, 
So this is not not the way to you know put a shoe on this way. And then we do see neglected feet. Um, uh, obviously, this horse hasn't been trimmed in a long time, and just a slight variation on the conformation pushes this huge flare to grow like this. Um, and here's a neglected donkey that you know came in that was rescued. Again, this is what happens when people don't take care of things properly. But you know what? We were able to just saw off the front and get the bottoms trimmed right, and the donkey was just fine. So we can help these horses. But thing, we're going to go over some hoof injuries and things to look for. Um, this on the left here is a, a, an abscess that blew out the coronary band at the heel. This horse is very, very lame until I open this up. It's another one that needed draining. And this, again, this, this pus that's coming out of the bar. This is kind of a favorite place to find abscesses in this region here, the point of the heel and where the bar goes. And then any place where there, there's junction of sole to uh, hoof wall. But a horse can have a puncture or any type of you know thing penetrating the sole anywhere around the hoof, just bad luck. Um, uh, people talk about thrush. Uh, you see thrush is a very destructive process. You can see this deep cleft here. This whole frog is very undermined. So it's you know something to look for, it needs to be treated and trimmed. Uh, canker uh, is just the opposite of thrush. This is very proliferative tissue here. Um, and this is an immune system reaction um, that some horses develop when uh, bacteria and, and, and uh, just all kinds of stuff invades the sensitive tissue. So thrush can turn into canker, um, but uh, there's usually other things going on to get to this stage. So this is a draft mule that came in and you can see this, this exudate had not been taken care of properly. And then after it's cleaned up and this has been soaked in a solution of chlorine dioxide and activated, and you can see how well it cleans things up. And then, you know, this is an ongoing process to, to cure this. But lameness can be caused by hoof shape. So here's an X and Y imbalance. And as the X and Y imbalance gets worse, you have this constant tearing, right? And you know, so you have chronic thrush. Again, you see different heights in the heels on this um, shot on the left. So the horse is, you know, this foot is working back, back and forth um, all the time, just tearing that tissue letting all any kind of uh, microorganisms in the environment get into uh, where there's uh, you know, blood supply and so on. And these, these horses are hard to you know, deal with the thrush no matter what you put in there. Um, some of these horses, we see these contracted heels. And so you can see how these heels are pinching. This whole foot is too narrow for the length of it. So contracted heels are kind of inside uh, our, our normal alignment. So again, things that, you know, make us, you know, we have to help this horse and we can do things shoeing wise. We create frog pressure, open those bars up and we can help all these horses. There are, there are fixes for them, but they're usually not overnight. Sometimes horses do things uh, that are dumb and they stick their foot in places and they get these, you know, an injury of the coronary band is definitely something to worry about. But if it's treated properly, you can see the same defect six months later is almost grown out. You can see a little bit of a defect on the coronary band. But again, this horse um, actually stayed pretty sound, but it was treated properly and they, they will grow this stuff out. So it's not the end of the world. When you see all this blood, it just has to be taken care of, right? Some horses just have mismatched feet. This just happens to be a Cornell Polo horse. And, um, uh, but she has a very crooked back also. So she needed a chiropractor more than she needed uh, me, I think, because there's not that much I'm gonna do to, to, to change um, those feet. Um, but you can see uh, on this lower photo here, I can find my cursor again, how um, she's got a lot of bruising right on. This horse is stabbing this toe into the ground. Um, and so you really you know, have to like, wonder why these horses are so mismatched. But if you look at this horse from the rear, the spine is very, very crooked. Um, again, back to chronic laminitis, you can see how this has all been trimmed out here. 
and uh, we've had to remove all this hook wall to get rid of all the um, stretched off lamini. And you can see some of these radiographs uh, show you how the uh, coffin bone is rotated downward. So we put on a frog support shoe. And again, this will help these horses. Lots of different ways we work on these horses. Uh, horses with coffin bone defects, if you have a chronic toe crack, there's usually a notch um, on the coffin bone um, there. Um, so one way we can support this is with a glue-on cuff style shoe, and that kind of holds everything together. Here's another one, uh, wasn't managed very well. Um, and so again, cleaning it out. We can make it look pretty, but making it look pretty is not as important as just keeping the foot together and, and keeping it clean. That's the main thing. But this horse has a, a notch in the coffin bone, and the, we would call this pedal osteitis, which is just a degeneration of the coffin bone. So that's the notch and the, the rough edges on the coffin bone is going to mirror the cracks we see in the hoof wall. So it doesn't matter what you feed the horse. You have to shoe this horse to help it, and these cracks will still be there as long as you, uh, as long as this horse, um, the, the notches in the coffin bone do not go away. They're more permanent. Uh, we Steve, think it's, yes. um, while we're talking about the hoof cracks, aside from the notches on the coffin bone, can you discuss what else might cause hoof cracks? Um, if we see uh, the, the notches and the hoof cracks we see in the front third of the foot are definitely have to do with pedal osteitis and, and a rough coffin bone edge, whereas the cracks we might see on the side of the hoof, what we call refer to as quarter cracks, because they occur at the quarter, um, are usually in your conformational imbalances. So the base wide horse that lands outside toe and then overloads the inside heel will have a, a predisposed to have a quarter crack on the inside quarter. The base narrow toed in horse that's landing on the outside heel and crushing that is more susceptible to the quarter crack on the outside quarter. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So, so um, those cracks are horses that don't land evenly tend to develop side bones also. So that's that super growth of, of the, uh, the lateral cartilages that tend to start to ossify. And um, so one of the things that we teach uh, veterinary students or that, that are taught is there, there's a, 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 an axiom called Wolf's Law. And that says bone remodels to force. So that's why having horses land evenly and uh, move like, you know, in a, in a nice even way reduces all the excessive force and produces less uh, bony reaction like ring bone and side bone and, and all the problems that, you know, happen over time. So, so bone remodeling the force is a very important thing to understand. Um, navicular disease, it manifests itself in many, many different ways, but well, if we look at this uh, uh, yellow line here, that's the Palmer angle. I'm not concerned as much with the hoof angle, which can be important to some horses, but the coffin bone or Palmer angle, and uh, behind it will be called the plantar angle, are very important. And this should have a positive three to five degrees from there to there. Um, and I, I'm from, from there off the ground, I'm sorry. So this has got very low, almost parallel to the ground. So we would call this a flat or low palm or angle. It should be up three to five degrees. So you can appreciate if this horse is crunching down on this navicular bone here, the forces that are taking place. And then if you look here on the, the it produces these rough edges on the navicular bone. So we can do things but with hoof management and trimming and, and shoe mechanics and support to improve the Palmer angle and improve the mechanics of a horse. But we, we have to do that before there's damage. To, to do it after there's damage, which usually happens, people don't realize they have bad mechanics going on and they don't look to do anything till the horse is actually lame. Now, it's much easier to understand this ahead of time 
and fix something before it's broke instead of trying to do it after. And so one way we manage chronic cases is this reverse shoe. Um, and that gives a lot of heel support and uh, improves mechanics with this um, open toed shoe here like that. So the horse breaks over with very little leverage at, at all and has lots of heel support and a little more um, uh, you know, extension behind the foot. Um, there are other ways that we help these horses by proper use of wedge pads and, and other appliances. This interesting shoe, people refer to this um, as the bank robber shoe. So legend says that, um, that some smart bank robber out west um, shot his horse backwards. So after he robbed the bank and took off, they, the posse chasing him went in the other direction. Pretty clever, huh? Um, and uh, some people call this the Napoleon shoe because legend says Napoleon had a whole regiment shod with backward shoes so that they tracked them in the wrong direction. I wasn't there, so I don't know. Um, chronic ring bone, uh, this is a lot of wear and tear, but there's a lot of what we call exostosis where these joints are here and quite often see this in some of the heavy breeds but you can appreciate how this toe is super long and horse hadn't been trimmed a lot. And so that causes a lot of leverage and crunching. And these are, you know, these are beyond just osteophytes, but this is just permanent scar tissue damage there. That's an extreme case. Um, sometimes uh, horses are brought in because they have a penetration injury. I actually see a lot of them. This horse was so lame they had to back the trailer up to the pasture. They didn't figure out why um, the horse, you know, uh, what he had stepped on, but obviously stepped on something sharp in the pasture. He would, you know, they had to drag him on in the trailer. They brought him down to me. Um, and then you can see right here where he actually penetrated and broke a piece of his coffin bone off. And um, I just, it happened to be late in the day and I had a practice shoe for teaching students how to. Um, uh, make a what's called a heart bar shoe, which is this. And I welded, I welded that piece in there on this bar shoe, and um, we cleaned it up. And believe it or not, the horse walked out of the shop like nothing was wrong with him. Yes, there was still something wrong, but the horse was not in pain anymore because the frog support welded in, stabilized the foot and the hoof capsule, and um, the horse now at least he was out of pain and he walked. You wouldn't even know the horse was lame. So now we had an, just an injury to deal with as opposed to a horse that didn't want to move. Here's a Belgian uh, that stepped on his toe clip, um, you know, tripped while he was driving. And you can see there's uh, a penetration right there and the toe clip cut a piece out. So, you know, yes, shoes are, can be dangerous. So working with the vets here, opening this up, we did a standing surgery. That's the piece we were able to pull out while he was still standing and sedated with a tourniquet. And then I made this big, big, this is about eight and a half inches across the shoe with a removable aluminum plate. And there he is, very happy. And, um, you know, and again, walked out much, much better. Um, we don't want to see things like that. So it's very important not to leave, uh, you know, carpentry nails around. But this horse also, this very, very lucky, um, the nail penetrated and missed everything important which is really good. Um, we put contrast dye in there just to see what it was doing after we pulled the nail. And again, these are the things we get to see in a veterinary hospital. We work on a lot of foals and we can do corrective shoeing for foals. And I refer to corrective shoeing as correcting limb deviations. So with either glued on uh, supportive shoes or uh, just glue itself, um, here a horse who couldn't stand without these glued on shoes behind. You can see his very, very flaccid tendons back there. Um, so we have to deal with all these. Um, but when we're looking at foals, uh, high-low horses, we see them in mature horses all the time. They're one-sided. They get, especially some of these warm blood breeds that are, are crossed with thoroughbreds, they have finer heads and they have long legs and they cannot reach the ground when they're grazing. So this is really important. If you're going to raise a foal, if you see a horse doing what's called this grazing stance and you don't do anything about that, 
um, you are producing a, a horse that's destined to be a high low horse. So he's going to be a one sided horse. And that's one of the I probably one of the more important things to take away if you're breeding horses and or buying foals is um, and now how do we stop them from grazing? Well, we don't put them in pastures where the grass is so short. We keep all their feed up in the air, hay nets, um, no feed on the ground. Do not let them graze and get in that grazing stance. And we can put shoes on them to protect, especially that foot that's behind him. Uh, they're just jamming that toe into the ground as he's growing. And um, the, the bones and joints are like, like plastic at this point. And so they're actually producing a higher heel. They're messing with the blood circulation of the foot. And that's going to be a stumpy foot with a weak shoulder. And the other foot is stretched forward. And that's going to be your low foot. And the horse is going to be a, a dominant to the right horse and not want to use. So, you know, in dressage, you go 50-50 in each direction. So you're always going to have weak scores on a horse like this. So don't produce high-low horses to begin with. Um, with foals, um, here's some of the stuff we do in correcting uh, deviations. We can, you know, if we have these foals early enough, they're not going to correct on their own when they look like this foal on the left. So we glue on medial or lateral extensions, depending upon the, the deviation. And uh, they may be candidates for surgery also. But this all has to be done um, generally within uh, three months. You have to evaluate them when they're very young, keep track of them and uh, you know, do what we call regular corrective trimming. And if that's not helping by their time, they're two to three months old, then these shoes need to get on and sometimes even earlier. And then two or three intervals of shoeing with these uh, uh, extension shoes. And especially if it's done before a growth spurt, um, then we can straighten these legs out pretty well. But the clock is ticking with these guys. So, um, you have to really make sure that you start early and observe, and they're not going to fix on their own. Here's another one that had an injury, and you can see this glue-on shoe with a heel support helped this. Uh, this is a donkey that was brought in. You can see a lot of the stuff we can do here. Um, Modern-day farriers, um, like myself, have a nice mobile shoeing shop. Here's one of my trucks that I used to have on the road. They have everything in there to you know, do quite a lot of different types of shoeing. And Modern Day Farrier is like our Foot Locker store, many, many different types and sizes and shoes, different shoes for different sports, um, from draft shoes to racehorse shoes to plastic shoes. Uh, aluminum is used a lot. Aluminum is a third the weight of steel. Um, steel is more durable. Aluminum is more expensive. It's easier to manufacture special shoes like you see on the top, which is for a horse with you know chronic ring bone problems. Um, uh, uh, aluminum is very nice for horses where you don't want a lot of swing weight and knee action. Uh, because, uh, the, um, the heavier the shoe, the more animated the gait is. So if you want to reduce animation, um, go to aluminum. But aluminum will not make a bad mover that's a big, heavy horse into a, a good mover if he doesn't have the right trim being done. So I've had a lot of these horses where they've tried aluminum because he's a lousy mover. But then when I work at them, they don't have them trimmed right. And we put a steel shoe on with the right trimming and the horse moves better than he ever did with aluminum. So aluminum is not always the answer. Um, and we can actually buy... Uh, different types of special therapeutic shoes. Um, I teach my students how to fabricate them. We put on a lot of glue-on shoes. There's a lot of different styles. They're great for um, laminitis cases and, and other thin-walled hoof injuries. So glue-on technology has been growing for the last 30 years. I've been involved in a lot of that. The old chapter on my book on that. And um, it uh, definitely takes special skills. Um, uh, still the most prevalent way to shoe horses is with a, a nailed on metal shoe, but we have many different versions that we can help, especially laminitis horses. Who are not hammering on their feet, giving them protection and helping them. And just a quick picture of many different types of horse nails that are being used out here. Um, different shoes require different size and nail types. So farriers need to be aware of that. Um, 
many, many different ways to shoe horses. Um, you have your gated horses uh, that you see, different types of race horses, you know, all these performance horses that are, are out there all need different types of shoeing, working horses, draft horses, reining, cutting, polo horses, all have particular um, shoes and techniques that are used to help these horses work safely and stay sound doing it. So from draft horses, special shoes for winter with studs and, and no snow pads. There's a quick little story here. So this is Justify. Um, you remember Justify, you know, won the Kentucky Der Derby and um, then he um, won the Preakness and then they're worried about him uh, making it to the, uh, the Belmont because uh, he was lame. They were very um, mysterious about why he was lame. And um, so this fellow here on the left, my good friend Curtis Burns, um, called me up and uh, Curtis is an excellent, excellent farrier. Curtis has what he calls his own manufactured quarter crack patch kit that is not justify his foot on the, the right, but um, a similar foot that we talked about on the phone. And Curtis was being told by all everybody trying to help him how to help justify and how to keep him in the race. So Curtis just wanted to run it by me. And I said to him, Curtis, you know how to shoe this horse. You have a, your own really good crack patch kit. And that's what you need to do. And end of story. Um, and then we spoke about another 15 minutes on his level of anxiety. And so I kind of just try to help him out from that end. But Curtis knew exactly what to do. And he didn't really need my help. And But he needed just a little friendship. And that's the, the patch you know, type of kit that he, he uses. And I say, you know what to do. And that's what, and he got justify and you know, the rest is history. Everyday hoof care, know what's normal for your horse. Pick out debris and inspect the feet and make sure there's nothing in there that shouldn't be. Treat any infections like thrush with, you know, commercial um, uh, 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 toppings that you can put on there. Do not let mud build up on carnet band and fetlocks. It can cause infections there. Check the shoes, know what's normal again. Um, and uh, here's some farrier students at Cornell. You see, we have quite a few women taking these courses now, um, but this is our shop at Cornell and we can chew four horses at once, no problem. Um, quick mention for the American Farriers Association. They have a certification program Starts with the certified farrier, then certified journeyman farrier, therapeutic endorsement is next. And um, they really have done a tremendous amount um, to help farriers become more educated, create some standards in the industry. These are all voluntary. So farriers go out of their way to take these exams and, and study for them and prepare. And so uh, the American Farriers Association has probably done more to help horses than any one body that I know of. Um, I do occasionally have to work on oxen. Uh, this thing, this guy weighed over a ton. He had a fractured coffin bone, so we glued a block on the other side. Uh, occasionally, I work make little pig shoes that I glue on. So here's, you know, some people have pet pigs and they get hoof infections. So I have a very, very varied um, experience at Cornell. Um, some of the uh, new technologies that are emerging to aid our traditional um, a work. Um, this is the workman or hoof feet um, uh, system that's out there that we can put sensors on the feet, track what they're doing and track changes. So you'll hear more about this stuff as time goes on. Um, and then again, quick plug for my book here. Um, and a lot of stuff we covered tonight are more detailed in the book. And I guess it's time to go. That's one of my horses. Um, so I appreciate you giving me the time and hopefully you uh, can take away something that's useful for you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I know we are running out of time, but we do have a couple of questions if we can maybe run through kind of quickly. Um, let's see, for a horse, not a full, but a mature horse that's high low, any recommendations? Yeah, so now we're into management on that. And sometimes if the horse is lame, for sure, you'd want some type of radiographs or lameness exam. 
But if you watch the horse move on the high foot, he's probably landing toe first. So, and he's probably hitting too hard on his heel on the other side. So to try and reduce each one to the right amount. And so it seems counterintuitive to trim excess heel off and then put a wedge on uh, the high foot. But if you think about what the coffin bone is doing in there, the coffin bone is at an extremely high angle. <clears throat> the horse is stabbing his toe on the high foot. And so we need to adjust the coffin bone angle or the palmer angle. And by trimming off the excess heel, the reason why the horse has excess heel is because he's getting more blood circulation and growing more hoof at the heel. And he's compromising his hoof growth at the toe and creating a little long-term damage in, in the coffin bone too. So if we can get the horse landing heel first and adjust that coffin bone angle, now we, <clears throat> if we trim that excess heel off, we have a lot of tension on that coffin bone. So that's why we put the wedge on. So now the palmer angle is more in line with the surface of, of the bearing surface and the horse will start landing heel first if it's done correctly and maybe grow a better foot and maybe use that side better over time. So that's the short version of that. Okay. Um, any thoughts on hoof oil? Um, if, if feet are really, really dry, um, it, it certainly can serve as a protectant. Um, if feet are very, very soft, hoof oils are just going to make them even more soft. So uh, uh, I'm not a big hoof oil person. But if you need to put a protectant on there uh, that like sheds excessive moisture in, in really wet areas or keeps uh, the right moisture balance inside the hoof in dry times, uh, tough stuff is a barrier that, that works to adjust the proper moisture balance and sheds the excessive moisture. So um, I think, you know, uh, an, uh, unless a horse has extremely dry feet, the hoof oil is, is uh, not really necessary. Okay. Um, copper nails versus traditional? So uh, the, 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 they're not copper, they're copper coated. And uh, where they really excel is, are in areas where there's a lot of corrosive environment, whether it be uh, horses in, in um, difficult paddocks, uh, a lot of urine, manure type of uh, problems. Um, steel uh, reacts with the environment to some degree. If you're on the near an ocean, especially uh, that that saltier air, definitely is going to you know deteriorate the nails with the moisture in the foot. So the copper kind of you know stops some of that. Um, there's a certain amount of thought process that. Horses that are susceptible to like the hoof wall diseases that they get, that they, the copper is an antibacterial. Um, uh, so the copper coated nails are useful for some horses in some places, um, uh, but I don't think there is uh, that much about them that's that special, tell you the truth. Um, and maybe if I shot horses in a different area, I would find differences in them. So uh, I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm not saying they're all that necessary either. Okay. And I know this is a huge topic, but really quickly, can you just touch on white line disease? Main, main definition of white line disease is a fungal infection of the, what they call the inner middle of the hoof wall. So the hoof wall has three layers. And so it'd be the stratum medium where it starts. And that what that does, it's basically horn digesting fungi. And it, it, it works its way up kind of the same way a termite, the termites get in the bottom of a board and the outside of the board looks good, but the inside is all crumbly. And so all the, the, um, the, the bad looking cheesy stuff you see when you trim the foot, um, that's like horn, digested horn that the fungi has digested. So they generally work their way up from the bottom to the top and all that has to be removed. And so uh, it sometimes affects the hoof wall similar to what a chronic laminitis horse looks like 
And so we treat them somewhat the same aside from killing the fungi, a frog support shoe, um, and uh, we don't wanna rebuild the hoof wall over the fungi because that just gives them a nice safe place to live. So we wanna make sure we kill the fungi, which are very persistent. Um, if, and horses, you can have horses that have uh, white Lyme disease and horses in the same place don't have it. So that's, why is that? And it could be an immune system problem that the horse is having. Okay, super. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for sharing all this wonderful information. I would highly encourage everyone to get a copy of Steve's book. And again, Trafalgar Square Books is offering a discount code that will go out in the email. And thank you again. Thanks for joining us. Okay, I hope, I hope it was fun. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. Good night.